We worship this morning according to the abbreviated service of the word on page 38 in the front of the hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Our reading of the Passion History from the Gospel of St. Luke continues in chapter 22, beginning at verse 54. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the gospel of the Lord. We sing the next hymn.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing Lenten study of St. Luke's Gospel from this 22nd chapter. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Someone has said the eyes are the window of the soul. We can learn a lot from looking in someone's eyes. A mother can read her child's eyes, whether the child is filled with sickness or sadness or guilt. We can tell, usually, whether someone is upset with us or whether they are simply teasing us gently by the look in their eye. Someone shows up at the door. We can see by the look in their eye whether they are filled with worry, pain, shock, Someone sits down next to us in some dark night of the soul, and we can tell from the look in their eye, compassion, sympathy, love, even before they open their mouth. This past Sunday, we noted that one of the Gospels tells us that Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and loved him. There is this look that the Lord has for his people in which he penetrates us, looks at us. The Bible tells us that on one occasion when Jesus was in the synagogue and he was about to heal a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. And the critics were there watching. The Lord looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their unbelief. What would you see if you looked into the eyes of Jesus? Those eyes that read you like a book and see every dusty, cobwebbed event of your past. What would Peter see? Looking into the eyes of Jesus. A look of pain, of penetration, Pardoning love. Law and gospel in a glance. And seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. He looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. You identify with Peter, don't you? I mean, how many times have you kind of put yourself into the shoes of the big fisherman in this account? Along with the other disciples, you flee the garden from the scene of the arrest running through the dark, under branches, tripping on, in holes in the ground and on stones. And at some point, out there in the dark, you stop. Beads of hot sweat on your forehead in the cold air of the night. You try to listen over the sound of your own heavy breathing the beating of your heart and your chest. Nope, no one's following. You don't hear any footsteps. 
Turning around, you wind your way back, retracing your own footsteps, and you see the torches in the distance and you hear some of the voices, but you pace yourself, you keep a safe distance. You want to know what's going to happen. Your fellow disciple, the younger apostle John, has doubled back before you. He has gained entrance into the outer courtyard of the high priest because, as the Bible tells us, he was well known to Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest, the dream team of the ages for the trial of the ages. It ain't what you know, it's who you know, and John gets you into the courtyard, and he's not doing you any favors. Temperatures at 2,500 feet above sea level in Jerusalem are cool on spring nights. Understandably, you gravitate toward the charcoal fire in the middle of the courtyard. You kind of join the huddle, so to speak, struggling to listen in to some of the conversation, rubbing your hands, wanting to blend in. But it isn't very long, and you aren't there very long, when the gal who ushered you in in the first place uh, she's been studying your face. And all of a sudden, all that kind of quiet mumbling and silence in the night is broken when she says, You also are one of them! Almost hear a pin drop. Why does she even notice me, you think? Is she just teasing? Is she maybe pretending she knows something? She wants to become part of the action? It's almost a reflex action on your part. You don't even really think about it. You say, man, I'm not. No. And you start to back away a little bit from the fire, maybe edge toward the exit. About an hour later, someone else saw him. He said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. Another finger pointing. And now everything goes into slow motion. Now you are placed on the spot. It is one thing to confess the name of Christ and to speak boldly for him that you would never turn your back on him or deny him. When you're preaching to the choir, when you're among fellow believers, it is another thing to boldly confess Christ behind enemy lines, to maintain your love for Jesus when the whole world's against you. When they care nothing for this one thing that means everything to you. When you stand to be ridiculed. It is one thing to say to your friends that, well, you of course would always remain faithful. Even if the whole world abandons Christ, denies him, and spits on the Bible. But maybe you say to yourself, now in this moment, this split second, sometimes you have to tailor things to the situation, you know? I mean, I attend church, a Christian school, but church is church and fun is fun and business is business. And why should I have to answer all these awkward questions about my relationship to the man from Nazareth? I mean, isn't that just sort of my private deal here? The Lord and I, we've got an understanding. It's my business. I don't have to talk to anybody else about this. And so reflexively, you simply say, man, I am not. And things are getting uncomfortable. Already off in the distance, you didn't even hear it. The first crowing of the rooster. 
And so time goes by and about an hour later another asserted certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. These questions aren't going to go away, are they? You're going to have to answer these questions your whole life long about your connection to Jesus. And so now the other question comes, well, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. That Galilean northern fisherman's brogue, whatever it was, gave him away. You couldn't even hide it when you denied it. And so now, in this moment of absolute fright, you start to turn the air blue. You call down curses on yourself. You swear by God and all that is holy that you have never met this man. Somewhere off in the distance, for the second time, the rooster, Crows. This time, you hear it. Your head jerks up. Everybody around the fire is studying your face. And across the fire, there, your friend, cuffed, beaten, bloody, the spit of his enemies all over him, being led perhaps from the chambers of Annas to the chambers of Caiaphas, across that porch perhaps, overlooking the courtyard. Your eyes meet across the fire, and the Lord heard this. He turned. He looks at you. And the look is a look of pain. His pain. You have added to his sufferings this night. He must endure not just the hatred of the world, not just the enmity of the Jewish leaders who should have recognized him as their Messiah. He must endure the caving in and the cowardice of one who said he would never abandon him and never deny him. And the Lord turns and looks. And it is a convicting, penetrating look. You thought you were stronger than this. You thought that you would never do this. You are disgusted with yourself, disappointed in yourself, that one Look, you run out of the courtyard, down through the dark streets and narrow alleys of the city. So angry with yourself, bitterly weeping, sobbing, shaking till you can't cry anymore. Out there in the cold night air, knowing what you've just done. You didn't think this would ever happen. Maybe you remember. There was that night on the stormy sea of Galilee. How confident you were. 
Lord, bid me come unto thee upon the water. Jesus said, come. He got down out of the boat. You began to walk to Jesus. But you know what happened. You saw the wind boisterous. You took your eyes off Jesus. You began to sink. You cried out, help, Lord, save me. And you know what happened. He reached out his hand. You recalled the word of the psalmist. He reached down from on high. He took hold of me and he drew me out of deep waters. And he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now you said after that that this would never happen again. You would never do that again. You would always remain faithful no matter what the rest of the world said. But then, in the courtyard, amid unfriendly looks, You swore you had never met him. You once again took your eyes off Jesus. What is the problem here? You were so sure. Yeah, you were sure. You were confident. You were confident of yourself, Peter. You had confidence in your own confidence, and you had faith in your own faith instead of faith in Christ. Oh, Peter, your tears are my tears. Why does it take a lifetime to learn this? The gospel is not about me. It is about Christ. Here we see this law and gospel in a glance. Not just his glance of his pain and not just the convicting penetration of that look that shows me how much I need him, but the look of undying love. Here in the gospel is where I learn, no, it's not about character building and 12 steps to getting my life together. It's not about how I feel about Christ. It's not about any of that stuff. It is about what Christ has done for me. How his perfect life counts for my life, and I can count on Christ. That his payment for sin becomes my payment for sin. And that he cast down the light of his resurrection into the dark of my own grave to bring me forth to life everlasting. The gospel is not how I feel about Christ, but about how Christ feels about me and what Christ has done for me. Look, a glance, both law and gospel, kind of like a stone being warmed by the midday sun. So beneath his glance of law and gospel, I come to see my great need of Christ and I come to see all that Christ has done for me. There would be another time when Jesus would look at Peter. Maybe you remember. It was sometime after that wonderful day of sunshine that we call Easter. And Peter and the others, they met Jesus on the beach, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Lord had prepared breakfast. The fish were already on. They sat down around the fire. As Peter had three times denied his Savior and wondered whether Jesus would ever want him back, 
once again their eyes meet across the fire. And three times, Jesus said to that apostle, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Oh, three times you tried to measure up, oh Lord, you know that I love you. Three times, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And with one look across the fire, he welcomed you back to be his apostle. This is what the gospel's about. It's what about the glance of Jesus as he looks at you and loves you and says, all of my doing is now your doing. All of my payment in full is now your payment in full. And all that I am now belongs to you. And you begin to understand the look in his eye. Oh, the height of Jesus' love, higher than the heavens above, deeper than the depths of sea, lasting as eternity. Love that found me wondrous thought, found me when I sought him not. Knowing that, you may now look into the eyes of Jesus and see nothing but love. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, thou innocent Lamb of God, before the Sanhedrin was falsely accused, spit upon, mocked, beaten, and sentenced to death as a blasphemer and a deceiver of the people, we beseech thee, show us the salvation that is in thy merit, and look upon us in mercy as thou didst look upon Peter, that sincerely repenting of our sin, we may obtain by faith the comfort of forgiveness that the end be found acceptable in thy sight, thou who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please read each other. 